Uh, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today on your Friday dinner time. Um, it's nice to see so many of you still having an active interest in medicine and, and, and helping people despite everything that's going on at the minute. So to see all of you here is, is really nice. Um, my name is Mark and I work in the Northeast at the minute. At the minute I work in A&E. Um, from August, I'll be going into GP. I graduated from Merchants in 2010, which seems like such a long time ago now. Um, I was actually Mr. Bonfante's form class all those years ago, which I'm sure he'll be over the moon to hear. That was 10 years ago as well. Um, A-level-wise, I did... Um, Maths and all the sciences. So I did maths, further maths, biology, chemistry, physics. Um, and I enjoyed them all. When I was applying, chemistry was a requirement and biology was a requirement in a lot of uh, medical schools. Not essential, but they liked it. And I did the others because I, I enjoyed them and I was relatively good at them in comparison to the arts. Um, a levels is dependent a lot on on you. I would personally, I would suggest doing at least at least three of the sciences or two of the sciences and a maths, just because it will help you going forward. Um, at university, uh, in your first few years, especially. Um, that's not to say though, if you are a fan of art, music, history, geography. That's not to say that you can't do one of those or one of the humanitarians, one of the art subjects. It's it's all based on on you and what you take away from it, and what you can what you can say in the interview that you've you've learned from each of those subjects and how you can carry that forward and and how that will make you a better doctor. Um, and rather that you can do that and you can justify your decisions. Um, certain medical schools, certain interviewers will will like that. Um, it will show that you are a well-rounded person. But equally, if you can say the same thing from your your science, your maths, A levels, then that's ideal as well. Um, when it comes to choosing a medical school, it's uh, again, it's very different and it's very individual as to what you what you prefer, what you like. It's it's really your first chance to choose how you learn. Um, the school curriculum is all it's, it's pretty much set out for you, but the different medical schools have different ways of teaching. There's there's the problem based learning and the PBL courses, which are quite uh, student led to a point. Um, which I, I personally found wasn't really for me. Um, there's the integrated ones, which is mainly lectures and some clinical work relatively early on, which I thought was really, really good. Um, and that's what I went for. And then there are the Cambridges and the Oxfords who do primarily a lot of academic work in the first few years before they get you into the clinical side of things. Um, which again, some people really like. They like having a strong foundation in knowledge and, and what they need to know before they get unleashed onto the onto the public. Um, and a lot of it is personal preference. And then location comes into it as well. Do you want to be close to home, far away from home? Uh, some of you will have reasons to stay close to home and some of you will want to venture further away. Um, so I went to Newcastle because it was the course that I wanted to do. And it was a really good city. It reminds me a lot of Liverpool without being Liverpool, if that makes sense. It gave me a chance to get a little bit more independence and move away from home, um, which was always the plan when I hit that point, really. Um, so, yeah, medical school is as individual as as each of you, and once you've had to look around a few, you'll just get a feel for a certain place or a certain course or somewhere you you, you won't like and you won't know why you don't like them. 
um, and some you will love and you won't know why you love them. But pick the ones that you love and that you don't really know why. Um, medical school itself is brilliant. A lot of people say sixth form is the best time of your life and it's hard to disagree. But um, medical school and university was, was was brilliant. It was it was so much fun. Um, you get to try out so many different things, so many new things that you won't have tried before. Um, it's a totally different way of learning, and you learn so much in such a short space of time. Uh, you'll meet people, you'll meet friends that will be friends for the rest of your life, and there's a good chance that you'll meet your future husband, wife there as well. Um, it's tough. Um, I've I've said to whoever has asked and whoever I've spoke to in the past that if medicine is what you want to do and you are 100% sure of that, then it is the best career that you can pick. I, I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, but if you're 50-50, you're not too sure, you're kind of 30-40%, then think about it, definitely. But um, it is a lot of work and it is really tough. Um, so that's also something to bear in mind. Um, some tough times at, at uni, uh, <laughs> exam-wise, revision-wise, uh, I say it's a lot of work and it's a lot to know, a lot to learn in a relatively short space of time. Um, but a lot of fun and there's so many different things that you can do there as well. Um, at a certain point, you'll get to go and work in the hospitals. You will get to pick what you want to do. Um, you'll get to go on an elective, um, which was which was excellent, which is eight, eight weeks, two months in a different country or this country doing what it is that you have an interest in. Um, for me, that was probably the highlight of, of the whole five years. Um, and then once you get partway through medical school, some of you may have an idea of what you want to do now. That may that may stay the same. That may never change. That may change drastically from from now and when till when you finish finish university. Um, I I personally always wanted to do surgery, um, uh, and through medical school that was still the case. And I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my surgical placements. And it was still what I wanted to do when I qualified. When I started working, my first job was in A and E, which was like being thrown in at the deep end. But it was it was brilliant, and that's where I've stayed for the last five years, really. Um, so things can change. I would say, yeah, if you have something that you really want to do. And something, an area that you you enjoy, you think you would enjoy, then focus on it. Um, and if you're sure, then do everything that you can tailor all of your experience, uh, especially at medical school, to that specialty. But also keep an open mind. So if you were on a medical placement or a um, or a surgical placement, a, an obstetric placement, you essentially get out of it what you put in. Um, and if you go into that thinking this is something that I have no interest in and something that I don't want to do, then there's a good chance that you're not going to take much out of it. Um, so I would say go into every placement, every lecture that with the with the thought process that this is something that I may end up in in the future um, and take an active interest in it. Um, there are so many different specialties to pick from. It's one of the beauties of medicine. Um, you can you can have people who deal with patients all day, every day. Uh, GPs, A and E, for example, um, and there are specialties where you you don't really deal with any patients at all. Um, and it depends on your personality and your person you are. And it's not to say that one specialty is better than another. They're all necessary and they're all very important. And they all feed into one another. So I suppose I didn't always know what I wanted to do. 
in hindsight. Um, there are tens if not hundreds of different specialties to pick from. So if there are certain things that you don't like, there will there will be something that interests you and, and something that you will be happy in um, for the rest of your life, hopefully. We need all the help that we can get. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'll say for the last five years, I've been in, in A&E in the Northeast, which is which is interesting. A consultant once told me that a and is, is the best specialty. He was an a and consultant, obviously, um, because it's the most interesting 15 minutes, half an hour of that patient's journey in hospital. And it's difficult to disagree. They come in with the most unwell and you get to see a relatively quick improvement, hopefully, which is, which is always nice to see. Uh, and to be honest, part of the reason, the majority of the reason why I got into medicine in the first place was to was to help to make people better. So to see it happen in such a short space of time, within the next few hours or so, is is great. It's really varied. You get to deal with everything, um, and that is literally everything that you can think of. Uh, it can come through a and these doors, um, especially on a Saturday night. And from children to surgical problems, medical problems, um, trauma, um, and it's it's great. From I say from August, I'm moving to general practice, which is yeah, a new a new journey for me, and um, but will also be interesting as interesting in its own way. I think it goes back to. You don't really have to know what you want to do, um, I suppose, and, and there's a there is a certain degree of flexibility, uh, especially at this stage in medicine. And I think a lot of that comes down to priorities and what what you want from life. Um, when you're younger, I think things like A and E and surgery are absolutely brilliant, and you've got a chance to focus on your career and you have no ties. And your priority is is primarily yourself and your career, which is which is great. And I think as time goes on, you start to think about other things, and I can see why people pick general practice from a from a work life balance. Um, the shifts in medicine can be tough. The roses can be brutal. Um, well, as I said at the very start, if you enjoy it none of that really matters. So I think in summary, A-levels do, I would do at least a few sciences or maths um, because you'll need them, especially at university. But if there is a subject that you really enjoy, it's not to say that you can't do it as well, providing that you can take something away from it. Um, and talk about that in your interviews. Medical school is as an individual as you are, and as long as it's somewhere that you like being and it's a course that you like to be on, you feel it's something that can be, that will facilitate your learning, then it's the right place for you. Um, don't worry if you just like medicine, you like biology and you don't know exactly what you want to do. There are a lot of people who have graduated and been graduated for a few years that don't know what they want to do yet. Um, it's not abnormal at all. So nobody's expecting you to have an idea of what you want to do now. Certainly keep an open mind with everything that you, you, you do and everything that you learn uh, because you'll never know when you need it. Um, I would highly recommend A&E. I think it's a fantastic place to work. It's very interesting. Um, especially at the minute, it's it's interesting. Uh, and I know a lot of people are worried and nervous. Um, and that's completely normal. Everybody at work is, is nervous as well. And everyone's a bit worried. But as I said at the start, I see so many of you still here 
and still wanting to to do medicine despite everything is is excellent and is is really nice to see. Uh, yeah. Mark, are you able to tell us about the current situation and how it's impacting you and your work and your colleagues? Yeah, um, I think everything that's going on at the moment is is brand new. Really, we have in the in the background there are always kind of pandemic safety nets, if you will, and, and protocols and what we do if if something like this happens, but nobody really ever expects them to happen. So where we are now is is kind of uncharted territory, I suppose. Um, it's completely changed the way that we were in hospitals and in, in general practice. It's changed surgeries. It's changed clinics. Um, everything's being done by telephone now, if it can be. The a &E wait times dropped significantly at the moment, which is nice. In terms of logistics, it's it's completely it's completely changed. Um, everything they've where I work, we've built uh, essentially a new a and &E in the space of, of a week, a week and a half, um, which has encompassed. The whole of outpatients, all the outpatient clinics, all the outpatient rooms, and the outpatient reception. Uh, so, Amy's about roughly tripled in size in the last week. Um, it's also brought different specialties down to to A and E. So, throughout the day now, the specialties will see their own patients for the most part. Um, orthopedics will see minor injuries. They'll see fractures, broken bones, that type of thing, without us seeing them. Anything that is vaguely surgical will be seen by the surgical team. Um, anything vaguely medical will be seen by the medical team as well, which is is a completely new way of uh, of triaging, of, of working in, in A&E. And then there's the the respiratory A&E or the, or the COVID A&E, which is where the old AE used to be, um, which is just for respiratory symptoms, essentially. Um, a lot of those are based in there, and there are still uh, medical specialties just for that particular a &E as well. It's, it has everything's changed. Um, even just going in to see a patient is... Um, your full personal protective equipment, your PPE now, which is which never used to be the case. You used to walk into a room, see somebody walk out, wash your hands and go see somebody else. Um, so it's far more time consuming, um, necessarily so. And logistics, it's it's changed completely. It's it's up and down the country. I'm sure you've all seen the um, the Nightingale Hospital as well in the Excel Centre. Um, for that to be completed in two weeks, roughly, is is pretty incredible. And the amount of volunteers and uh, the amount of staff that have uh, volunteered to go and work there is is incredible as well. It's um, it has it's it's completely changed the way we work, especially at the moment. And I think I think going forward as well, once this all settles down, I think it will change. Uh, how we do things uh, for the better, hopefully. Um, I think some things will go back to the way they were, but hopefully some things will stay as they are now um, because it seems to be working pretty well. Do you feel safe in work, Mark? Um, I think where we are, we're, we're not too bad. Um, to be to be completely honest, we we have we have had several cases and we've had unfortunately several deaths as well, but nowhere near as many as the likes of London or Birmingham or, or Liverpool, which is which is creeping up as well. Um, so at the moment we have enough masks 
gowns, goggles, gloves, um, for everybody to wear, everybody to be safe, personally, at the moment. Now, if if we start to get even tens more people coming through, we're going to run into a bit of a problem, which is what's happening in the likes of London, Birmingham. Um, and I'm sure it will start to happen in the likes of Liverpool and Manchester as well, the big cities. Um where the level of PPE isn't, there isn't enough of it. Um, and I think the guidance has been a bit vague from uh, Public Health England and in contradiction with the, the World Health Organization guidelines as well. Um, I'd say everybody, it's, it's, it's brand new, nobody really knows kind of how this is going to progress or what's going to happen. In the next common in the coming months or so. Um, given that we're seeing a lot of younger people suffering severe symptoms as well, um, it would stand to reason that people in high risk areas should be in the FFP threes, the the proper uh, the proper PPE, which to me makes sense. Um, and I think I think the guidelines are changing with regards to that as well. Uh, for certain procedures, you have to wear it. Um, we have to wear a mask all the time at work anyway. Um, and for us, if we're going into somebody who we know who is confirmed to have it, then we will fully gown, proper mask, goggles, gloves, headscarf, the whole thing. Um, as opposed to if it's somebody who suspected it's it's a surgical mask, gloves, and a, an apron, which if the if the confirmed isn't isn't enough, really. Um, but the the equipment is there for us in our hospital at the moment. But I know that's not the case everywhere, and I know there are going to be shortages. There are shortages, and there are going to be shortages nationwide. If um, if we don't start to get more stock in. So at the moment, I feel relatively safe, but I know there are a lot of my colleagues uh, around the country that don't. Okay, we've got a few questions on the left-hand side. So Molly's asked, why did you decide to change from A&E to GP practice? Um, I think it's a good question. I think it's a fair question. So I, I love A&E. I always will love A&E. Um, and I think even when I'm training for GP and when I become a GP, I will I will still do shifts in A and E. I think a large part of it was, as I say earlier on, priorities change, and the shifts in A and E and the rotor for A and E is 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 really difficult. Um, and I'm not I'm not averse to hard work at all. But if and when I have a family, I would like to see them grow up. I would like to not miss everything that they do, be that concerts, football matches, rugby matches. And so I would like to make it for at least some of them. Um, and the A&E route is really quite antisocial, which at the minute is, is fine. Um, so for me, it was, it was a little bit of a, a work-life balance uh, thing more so than than the enjoyments of of what I do at the moment, which I love. So yeah, uh, fair question, fair question, Molly. Um, another question: What were the biggest challenges in your first year of medical school? Um, oh, that's another good question. I think I think it was for me. It's a totally it was a totally different way of of Len, it was mostly lecture based, some anatomy sessions, some clinical sessions. Um, but you're expected to go from relatively small classroom based teaching um, and relatively structured kind of lesson plans. This is what you're going to learn. This is your exam. This is your end goal, if you will. Um, to 
there's hundreds of you in a lecture theatre, you make your own notes. If you don't make your own notes, you either have to get them off somebody else, so you have to go and find the lecture online if it has recorded, um, which it didn't all the time. Um, it goes really quickly. You get six, seven lectures a day. Um, not all on the same topic. So keeping up and keeping organized is was was very difficult. And for me that was the biggest the biggest challenge. The content itself was of course a step up from GCSE and A level. Um but the content, especially in first year, isn't too bad. It's it's just the amount of it. There's, there's so much of it to learn. Um but it was the it was that change from kind of small classroom based teaching to big lecture halls and your own independent learning, being an adult learner, I suppose. Um in in that really short space of time, that quick turnaround between the end of, of A levels and the start of, of university. That was probably the most difficult um thing for me to to change and to get used to. Um, Mr. Bonfanti said on the left hand side, you're one of the best students he's ever taught. He said you were in his top three. Only the top three. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's 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 very nice one to say. He's he's also in the top three best teachers that I've ever had. <laughs> Only the top three though. Okay. Um has anybody any other students got any questions they'd like to ask? Do you have any advice for getting into medical school? Any specific advice that you would you would give students, Mark? Um, I think I think to get into medical school is is probably the the toughest or one of the toughest things um, over, that you will do over the next couple of years. Um, medical school itself is is tricky and can be difficult at times, um, but getting in for a lot of people is. Um, a lot of people would say that's the hardest part. Um, essentially, what you what you need to do, you need a a good personal statement. Always helps. Um, Mr. Bonfante helped with me. Helped me with mine. I'm sure he will, if anybody needs it, will help you with yours and make yourself stand out. All of your extracurricular things that you do, and I'm sure that you do, you do loads, um, is great. And it shows how kind of well-rounded you are as an individual. Uh, being a doctor is not just about being good at the science, if you will, Um the same with your volunteer work, um, your work experience. Go and volunteer in a hospital, or go and volunteer in a hospice, go and work as a healthcare assistant somewhere. It doesn't really matter what you do or what you volunteer as or what extracurricular activities you have. As long as you can, can go into that interview and reflect and say, this is what I learned from each one. This is what I've taken away from it and this is what I can offer. Um, this is what I can offer your university and, and, and my patients when when I graduate. Then that's what they're after. The you if you do if you do one or two extracurricular activities and have have a certain number of hours of work experience, but you can say this is what I've learned. This is what I've taken away from it, um, and this is how I can apply it to. Uh, to university and to, to my, my career, my job, that works and they will look for far more favourably upon that than if you um, if you have 10 different extracurricular activities and you've done 100 hours of volunteer work, but you can't say what you've taken away from any of it. I think that's really good advice, Mark. So we're definitely talking quality over quantity in terms of hours put in. 
um, any year 12s will have seen the message I sent recently that has asked you to reflect on about nine key skills. I realise that at the moment we're in a bit of a state of flux in terms of work experience and volunteering. So what I'd ask you to do is try and find examples from other things that you're currently doing to evidence those things. I did speak to Liverpool University yesterday. Um, there is a conversation going on within medical admissions about pushing the early deadline back, possibly, for current year 12. So it wouldn't be the 15th of October to give you a bit more time. And um, there was also a conversation about what the expectation will be for work experience and volunteering. And when they've confirmed that, I will absolutely let all year 12s know what that situation looks like. Um, yeah, I think that's a very fair point as well. I think it would, to me, again, I have no, I have no, no part in in the the interview process for any any of the universities. But I think it would make sense to to push it back a little bit this year, especially because not much is going to be happening volunteer wise or work experience wise for the next few months, um, especially, and and who knows after that. Um, the only other thing I would say for your interviews is uh, no, uh, no something about medical ethics, no at least the four pillars and be able to discuss them, um, and no something about recent NHS developments or or recent developments that have been going on in 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 health. It will primarily be the NHS that they that they want to discuss, but um, it could be it could be something else, and I. I have I have absolutely no doubt that this year it's going to be about uh, about the coronavirus and something about that something about how you would how you would feel about working in that environment are you prepared to work in that environment or they could tie both in together in terms of your ethics question as well um, with regards to something like your your do not attempt resuscitation forms and and coronavirus and what you think about about that whole situation as well um so be prepared to ask or be prepared to be asked um, either an, an ethics question or a, a question about something recent developments that have been going on in the in the medical world and uh, there is no right or wrong answer to most of those questions as long as you can give a, a balanced view you don't say anything too too ridiculous has anyone else got any more questions for Mark? It's all gone quiet, Mark. You've obviously yeah. answered everything that we need to. Um, Mark, how would you feel if students wanted to ask you questions directly? Are you happy for me to give out your email address if students ask me? Yeah, of course. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well. Email address. Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, I've got that off Jonathan. OK, well, if nobody has anything else to ask, um, thank you all very much for attending. Um, and we'll see you all very, very soon. It's lovely that so many of you turned out. And thank you very much, Mark. Really, really appreciate your time this afternoon. We know you're very tired after a very long week in A&E. So we really appreciate you sparing your time to talk to us. Oh, here we go. Somebody just asked a question. Sorry, Mark. All right. Would recent developments include the second patient to be cured of HIV due to a bone marrow transplant? Um, yes, definitely anything. Just just because of everything that's going on at the minute doesn't mean that there aren't um, other things going on, other research, other kind of groundbreaking medical uh, research developments as well. Um, so yeah, but I, do do you read rounds? There's it depends again. It depends on your interviewer. Uh, you might get a an interviewer who will focus on the big things that have been in the news. That the interviews are there to to help you, really. They're not from from my experience and from people that I've spoke to. There's not a lot of interviews out there who want to trip you up, who want to to kind of make you feel bad, or um, who, who don't want you to get into their university. Um, so they will ask things that have been in the news. Uh, the most popular things, for example. Um, but there will always be the odd one who will ask something a little bit. Um, it was something 
And that will have been in the in the papers, for example, but not not as as high profile as as certain other topics. Um, so yeah, especially from from now, really, um, keep an eye out on on everything that's happening, N- newsworthy. Anyway, um, so that's that's going on, but it's uh, that was just a, an example a bit from from my point of view is. Yeah, the coronavirus is dominating everything at the moment, and I would be surprised if that wasn't the most commonly asked question in an interview next year. Uh, but that's not to say that there aren't other things happening, and they, they can certainly ask you ask you questions on on anything really, any recent developments, any any groundbreaking newsworthy things that have that have happened in the last year or so. So so yeah, yeah, definitely. Another student has asked your personal opinion. Do you think the development of a coronavirus vaccine or a HIV cure is the biggest issue at the moment? What are your personal thoughts on that? As in which is which is more... What do you think is a bigger issue at the moment, the development of a coronavirus vaccine or a HIV cure? Um. I think that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, um, a HIV cure is uh, potentially more important, more groundbreaking. I would say um, the coronavirus is terrible. It is it is killing people. It's it's putting young people in intensive care on ventilators, but for the most part, and this isn't mean it's town callous, ninety eight percent of people are getting better from it. Um if not and if not a number a little bit higher. Um so it is terrible and it is uh, and a small percentage of a very big number is still a big number. I'm not trying to to to, to play that down at all. Um but I think HIV has been been a killer for for thirty years. Um and it used to be a death sentence, and I think if we can find a cure for that, for me personally, that would be more groundbreaking than a, um, a vaccine at the moment. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Um, happy to take more questions on the left-hand side. If you want to leave the chat, you're absolutely more than welcome at this stage, and I hope to see you all again soon. Mark, could you just hang on a minute, just in case anyone asks anything else as they're sort of leaving the chat? Yeah, of course. Thank you. The student that asked you about the HIV cure or the corona vaccine said that he even personally found the HIV cure a more interesting and useful topic. Yeah, uh, I, I, I find it hard to disagree. I think, um, I'll say for especially, especially 20, well, as possibly as recently as it's kind of 10, 15 years ago, it was a, it was a death sentence for for. for hundreds of thousands millions of people and um if we can if we can find a cure for for hiv that's that's absolutely huge um, and i imagine science and and the, the history around it is um it is probably far more interesting than um than all the coronavirus uh, stuff at the moment um, i think I think in the future, I think 
and, and as I say, nobody really knows what's going to happen with with the uh, with the coronavirus, and I think it will it will settle down, and it's probably going to be something that's always always around. It's it might be like a common cold. It might peak at winter times, say, um, but it won't it won't be as devastating as um, as HIV has been long term. Okay, well, that looks like it's it. Thanks very much, Mark. I really appreciate your time.